Hi, this is Jack Neville, and you're listening to the Two Furs Angling Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Matt Kleiber from Puget Town Fly Company. This podcast is brought to you by Puget Town Fly Company, a brick-and-mortar fly shop located in Tacoma, Washington. For orders, please call 253-472-2420. They mail all across the United States. And Two Furs Angling, a Washington-based fly fishing guide company with the idea to not only help you catch fish, but teach you how to be a better angler. For booking, please email me, Jack, at twofursangling at gmail.com. That's T-W-O-F-I-R-S-A-N-G-L-I-N-G at gmail.com. Two Furs Angling Podcast is here to help all anglers, regardless of style. We bring you up-to-date product information, interviews with industry professionals, tips and tricks on setting up your gear, fun fishing stories, and knowledge at no charge to you, the angler. Two Furs Angling Podcast, Episode 5, here with my co-host Matt Kleiber, and today we're going to talk a little bit about spay lines, and we're going to do a little bit of a recap of our recent steelheading trips that we each took, um, kind of just a day after each other on the same river, um, but separately. So, first off, let's dig in. How was your trip, Matt? I mean, <clears throat> overall, it w- I mean, it was cool. Yeah. Um, it's always nice being away fishing, but the flows are so low that yeah, it just wasn't fishable for at least what I what we think. Especially you guys took a hard boat down. Yeah, it's different. Than, yeah, and the flows were like three fifty. Uh huh. Fishable in most people's eyes is kind of that five hundred to eight. 100 even 900 yeah. all the way up to even a thousand possibly but kind of between 500 and a thousand is really for most guys that's what would be considered um very fishable and very productive flows so a little bit on the low side for sure right for you lo- yeah well a lot of it i mean yeah i could see clearly through like 30 foot holes Oh, straight to the bottom it was, to like the color of the rocks oh dude it was crazy how easily how far you could see like in the deepest holes ever like literally not over exaggerating probably 20 foot holes yeah they're massive where you're like I, I i don't know that i could swim to the bottom of that thing 30 foot deep holes and you could see clean to the bottom it was crazy the level of <laughs> clear clearance on your water dude i saw two trout and they were flashing. So I saw a bunch of white fish though. So if we were really after white fish that day, probably could have caught some. And that would have been better than what happened. And then skunkitude. Yeah. <laughs> then skunkitude. Yeah. Well, and the difference too is you were doing spay. Yeah, and we were. Doing I was spay. fishing, nymphing. Um, were you? Beads, pretty much. Yeah. 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 Bobber dogging. Yeah, beads. exactly. Well, yeah. bobber dogging is. Uh, that's pretty much the same, right? But side drifting is the one that's a little different, right? Because they got a little more weight, yeah. No, bobber dogging works pretty good. And you guys were going a little bit for springers, too, or hoping to to get into some springers. But the flows were definitely too low. Dude, we saw zero fish. Water we floated all Yeah, I know you guys long. floated the whole fucking river. That's the longest float I've ever heard of. Uh-huh. Because, like, dude, that's, like, longer than our bass trip float. Yeah. Lengthwise, that's crazy. Yeah, I don't think we got off. We got off at like eight. I think it was. Jesus, that's crazy, dude. That's, that's we got on at five. That's a long day. Yeah, that was yeah. Rough. I don't know how you did that. That's why we didn't do it the next day. <laughs> yeah, I bet I wouldn't do it the next day either. That's for sure. I mean, we floated just you know the short float, super short, the shortest float that you can do on that river, basically. Yeah, and. uh that's a long day for me. Like I don't, I don't like doing even that float. I I had to push a lot. Yeah, but you guys are you know stepping in. You know that's what I mean? true. And yeah, if you're just, swinging, whereas if you're just through. pushing through, yeah, doing your nymphing, you're probably moving a lot more. So yeah, it's probably a much shorter day. That's you got a point there. I didn't bring enough snacks either. That always, I always happens. I always find that I don't bring enough snacks. And one day I'll probably figure it out. Like I kind of got my my raft kind of dialed in. Like I I had to adjust the frame after we we fished that thing because I was used to having you up front mm-hmm. and only you up front, nothing in the back, right? But then I had Lucas and uh, in the back and Bennett in the front. Dude, and the raft was like 
sitting like that the whole time that I was rowing. Like literally the front <laughs> of the boat was like maybe a foot and a half out of the water. Like it was it was clear how much it was like boom tilted straight straight up. So yeah, I had to move the frame like all over the place, moved everything forward. Um but it should be pretty good now. I got it, I think I finally got it kinda dialed in. And I think I figured out what cooler can sit up front. I'm still in between if I want to use those. Uh, you know, they build like a wooden platform up front. Or if I just want to throw a giant cooler up there. I feel like a wooden platform is better. Like for your feet? Around the front? Yeah, like right, where, that. Yep, right where I put the so cooler before. Platform. Yeah, it would just be a big platform basically. But then I'd build a box into it. So my little cooler, my 35, would drop into one of the boxes, and then on the other side, I'd have a box that I could, you know, store stuff in. Right. Yeah. Right. So that would be good for Bella, too. Yeah, that's the goal, is that she'd be able to walk on that mm -hmm. and be on the platform. But I think I'll end up doing that. But, yeah, I just so it was a tough day at Ford, Rowan, and brutal how low those flows were. I mean, we had to get out and drag the boat probably 20 times, man. It was It was awful. Dude, I was I was out of the boat more than I was in the boat. Well, a hard boat, dude. Like literally, what when we were floating down, every time that we hit a section, we'd be like, "How the hell did Matt get a hard boat down this? It's like crazy. this is it's crazy. a winching game, winching game and pulleys, yeah, exactly, man. Exactly, dude. You're just like, you know, caterpillar in your way down there. Dedication. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And more the fact so. that that's where our vehicle is. Yeah, exactly. So. You're like, I got no choice to get there but to get down now. Uh-huh. Well, and the funny part, too, right? So when we put in that morning at the put-in, you know, because it's that super deep slot. Yeah. It, dude, it looked like it was moving fast. Like, I literally said to Lucas, I was like, ah, dude, the flows don't look bad at all. Like, this is, it looks like it's moving pretty good through here. And it was for the first mile. And then it just went to shit. Yep. Yep. And it's just like super wide gravel bars that are like with two inches of water flowing over the whole thing. And I'm just forward rowing trying to build up momentum to get as far onto this gravel bar so we don't have to push that far as I can, man. It was brutal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Uh, it's always a good day up there. It's pretty. It's you know. It uh, definitely it, is. You're you're out in the the forest, so you can't complain. And any time you're on the water is more fun than not. But it would be nice to like at least you guys saw fish. We did. We we saw a handful of fish. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, man, dude. The hopes. I think that we saw a handful of fish probably because. Uh, multiple guys had gone down before you guys, and if you're in a hard boat and you're clanking off these rocks and you just hear boom, boom, boom going through the water and stuff, because the couple fish that we saw, we saw a couple in um, kind of moving lanes, really, um, and we saw one that was kind of holding, but uh, a dude, when we went over that one, that fish, and I wouldn't even be rowing, like I'd be standing up looking for fish, and just my raft just floated through. It was so gin clear that those fish would see the raft and just bolt. I mean, that you'd see them for a second, and then all of a sudden they'd be gone. They'd be flying upstream as fast as they could. And I'm like, this isn't exactly <laughs> ideal conditions, you know? Uh, not at all. I mean, if you have to drag, the, the way I look at it, if you have to drag a boat at all, <laughs> the flows might be a little too low. Like, well, you, sometimes we had to drag my, uh, my drifty through that one section and I was okay with that because it was, it, you know, you're fishing, you're just trying to get to one hole and you're fishing right, such a we're deep not, section. Yeah. You're fishing holding water. You're not fishing moving water and you don't really care that those fish, uh, have been sitting in that water for a little while. If anything, it's better that it's hard to push through up top because you're like, boy, these fish are going to hold in this deep water for a while. And they do. They do that big circle back know, down yeah. and come back up it. Yep. You're like, why yep. are you pushing? We got to go do that this year, dude. We got to hammer them on the, on the quill you. I love that fishery. Yeah, man. We'll see what they do. You know? Who knows? No kidding, right? It's always, hey, are they going to... I was talking to Lucas, and I'm like, man, who knows if they're going to open this thing this winter or not. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, I mean, it is. There's a lot of 
fisheries right now that are at best up in the air, whether or not they'll be open. Yeah. Crazy to me that the Skagit had a good enough return two years ago to be open through the whole winter. I mean, it was producing the best return on the in Washington State for winter return steelhead, but they just didn't have the funding last year to open it up again. They got a massive run of uh, springers this year. Did they? Yeah. yeah. You seen and a I bunch mean, of guys? Like big boys. Yeah. Do, well, it it produces. They're they're getting back fish before they opened it. Uh, I don't remember who Wild Steelhead or someone before they opened it the first time had produced um, the numbers, and they were getting more more of a return than the Quileute system was as a whole. Wow. Right? Wow. So they definitely get a lot of fish back. Um, I don't think that that's the issue. I think the issue is that they don't have the funding to enforce to, to keep fish counters and stuff on it. And uh, it's funny when you go up there, too. It's like that is like the fly fishing river. Like you actually see a bunch of dudes fly fishing and like hopping out to spay fish and stuff. Yeah. Whereas, like, when you got to Forks, you're, like, the only dude. You might see, like, another dude, and you're, like, yeah, brothers in solidarity. You know? <laughs> <laughs> hey, how's it going? Hey. You spay fish, too? That's crazy. You We're the only ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a funny fishery like that. Like, I think it's just because it's so famous for it. You know what I mean? Whereas Forks is, is like, gear fishing central, you know? Like, that's where people go to, to go float bait and stuff. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean... I know I have. <laughs> I mean, I know. No, it's cool. And I want to do the Chinook fishing this fall. Do some bait fishing for Chinook. I've never I've never done the skein deal, so got to get into it. It's a fun time. It is. I think once you switch to fly fishing and then you go to gear, you're kind of like your boundaries aren't there. You know what I mean? Like if you're a gear dude, you're like, "Oh, I don't fish bait. I fish whatever I fish." Uh, jigs I only jig fish and you like you have this boundary but once you go all the way to I only fly fish I don't gear fish when you do gear fish you're like yeah let's do the dirtiest way like let's go all the way let's let's go to the floating bait man like this is all past my comfort zone anyway (laughs) it's like might as well go to the effective one yeah and you know I've been realizing there's situations Mm-hmm. And that you're, you know, floating down and sure. you're like, yeah, fly fishing works really well. But yeah. You could throw out, you know, a vibrac with a hoochie on it and slam for coho, for yeah, example. Yeah. 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 Um, compared to somebody who's casting and stripping, it just, yeah. I don't know if it's not the same, what they're yeah. looking, you know what I mean? Looking for Me or and what Lucas, it is. Well, and you, I mean, you think about a Colorado blade that creates so much vibration and so much sound in the water. And you've got that little hoochie on the back that's swimming it swim, swim, you know, and it's got the big vibration in front and shining and flashing and everything. There's just a level of noise and I, the vibration, I think, is really what gets them that thud, 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 thud. And uh, I just don't think that you can get that same effect via fly fishing. It's just not possible. There are lots of situations, though, where I think where fly fishing works better. You know, low water conditions and stuff. Throwing a, Like I throw that coastal quick shooter for coho in the, in the, so that way it's nice and clear up front. And you can fish those little woolly buggers to like holding fish and stuff. Gear guys can't catch those fish. No. And you can on a fly. You can crush them on a fly easily. I mean, it's really not hard to catch those fish. It's when you get into the moving fish in deep water that have been hammered. I think that's when it's tough to, uh, or fresh fish that are like uninterested in your fly and they're not scared of a vibrax yet. But fly fishing works great sometimes. Gear fishing works awesome sometimes. You right. Know, like that's I was saying, it's different scenarios. Well, I was talking to Lucas about it the other day. And we were like, you know, if you're going to a brand new river and you're hoping to figure it out, take you a long time to figure it out swinging flies. If you were only swinging flies, it'd take you a long time to figure out where fish hold in that river and where they, 
For sure. <laughs> for sure. Years. Several years. Yeah, it would take you like four or five years to really figure out where fish are holding. To get on a level where you could guide that river, Right. it would take you a long time. I think if you gear fished, it'd take you like a month. <laughs> it's kind of true. If you if you were floating in gear the whole time, you know, like center pin or something, so just something crazy effective, which in my opinion, center pin is the most effective way to catch steelhead. I mean, I don't think that anything compares. I don't actually center pin, so I have no... No, I know. No, uh, your buddies do. All your hand. buddies do. Yeah, but I harass them for center pinning. So. <laughs> yeah, you do. You harassed me very heavily when I was in the center <laughs> pinning. Every time. What? I just... Dude, it's like I say, your buddy's not your buddy if he doesn't harass you. That's true. Yeah. If your buddy's not giving you shit for something... Probably everything that you do, like f- literally everything. If you're breathing and your buddy's not giving you shit for it, he's probably not that great of a buddy. Uh, so, yeah, you know where me and Matt stand. If you come fishing with us, you're going to get heavily harassed. Oh, always. It's what, you, it's, what, it's what you need. Some people just need it. If there's not some friendly shit talking going on between I and Matt and the other person who's fishing with us, then the fishing trip has gone horribly wrong. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, but I agree with him. I think Lucas is right in the sense that if you're looking to figure out and learn a river, if you got some buddies who are good at gear fishing, it's not a bad choice to float the river with them and let them catch some fish. And right. you're like, okay. Because if you float gear through four times or whatever through a run, you're like, okay, there is or there wasn't fish there. You know, if you caught something, there was fish there. If you didn't catch anything, there's probably not any fish there. Whereas if you swing through, you're like, nah, maybe there was a fish there. I really don't know. Yep, Maybe no he just idea. doesn't like my stuff. Maybe I wasn't getting down to him. Maybe, you know what I mean? There's so many variables. It is, swinging is by so very far the most difficult way to catch steelhead. Like, it's not even close to gear to, to gear fishing or even nymphing. It's so much more harder to catch fish swinging than it is nymphing that it's crazy. Well, it doesn't help when... A vast majority of spay guys like to stand in in one hole oh and singly gosh. only fish that one hole for their entire day. And there's this whole river that they yeah. could be stopping at. If you're spay through. fishing and you're not constantly moving to find fish, you are doing yourself such a disservice that it is insane. Like if you don't move to four different spots throughout the day you're insane in my opinion well especially if you're gonna go swing forks yeah look at the it, rivers that are all right there you can yeah. jump to different rivers if you want we did when we went well, with we hit with jason gordon three different rivers yeah. that day yeah we just kept searching for i didn't like the water conditions on the hoe which we might have caught a fish on the hoe like right. they weren't bad conditions they were a little bit too fast and a little bit too colored up just past what i would call prime which then the bogey and that was that yeah, well, was actually we, looking pretty good. It was amazing, but we went to the Kalawa first because we were like, "Well, this is a little fast and colored up. Let's go to the extreme on the other end." Because I would say that the hoe is probably the dirtiest and, and biggest flow. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's the first one to blow out and the last one to go out of shape. So we went up to the Kalawa and that was too clear, too gin clear. We swung, you know, and did some nymphing too through through a couple holes there. And uh and then we switched over to the bogey and walked in and boom. I mean yeah. as soon as we got there, probably within an hour, I hooked into that big big steely and, and brought him almost to hand. But you know, that's a great example of you gotta look for the conditions. You can't just be like Hey, I love this Ridge Wine Bar or whatever. You gotta be like, hey, I don't give a shit where I go. It's all about the conditions. It's like Anil said. You know, people always ask him where he's going or whatever. Where are you going? Or blah blah blah. And he's like, I don't know. And people think that he's you know full of shit and he's trying to hide his, his spot or hide his river or whatever. And uh, just not the case. You legitimately, if you're doing it right, in my opinion, you don't know until that morning. 
Like we wake right. up in the morning and look at our phone and we're like, oh, the flows did this. The flows. Okay, cool. We'll go on this river. Or we'll go do this, you know. And I think if you're not doing that, I think you're doing yourself a huge disservice. You sh- you should, everybody who is into anadromous fishing should have a mastery of USGS current conditions. <laughs> Like you should be a pro at finding your river and figuring out what flows. Like you should, if you're really, if you want to get good at anadromous fishing, at least every week, regardless of if you plan on fishing in the next month, whatever, you should be constantly checking flows. Yeah. Like I find myself all, especially when I was at the shop, anytime that got slow, you just flip over to that USGS current conditions check it out for anyone who doesn't know google it usgs current conditions washington and i believe it's like current stream flow there's two different ones that'll pop up and one will be like a giant map that has a bunch of like what the rain is doing and stuff that's not the one that you want the other one shows you they have a bunch of flow charts on it and it'll pop up and it'll say current stream flow conditions and you can scroll through, I think it starts out with the Chehalis Basin for Washington, and it goes through every river in the state that we have a stream flow data chart on. Most rivers have multiple on them, and you just look for the one that's closest to where you plan to fish. Like, for example, um, like the Bogus Shield, for example, has one way up by Highway 101. That's not the one that you want. You want the one near the push. Um, cause you're probably not, you're not floating for sure. I would say, unless you got like a water master and you're willing to hike way up there, but most people aren't fishing up by one Oh one. That's no. way, way up there. Um, whereas La push, it's going to give you an accurate reading for the lower river, basically the hatchery down. So that's what I check. And, uh, that's true of every river. I mean, they got one for the Wainuchi. I think they have three for the Wainuchi, don't they? So. They've got a couple for the Chehalis, I think three or four. Yakima's got them. Any, any Chehalis, any river that you want to figure out beforehand, hey, is this in shape, hey, is it not, check that. That said, rivers like the Cowlitz or something, they might blow out in the middle of the day because they might release the dam. So I've been on the river where you put in that morning and you're like, ah, it's great flows. You put on up by the dam, you know, up by the, yeah, and float down to Blue Creek and like halfway through the float, all of a sudden you're just moving super quick and you're like, let's jump on the thing and figure out what, what just happened. And you check the stream flow conditions and you're like, oh, it's up. They just bumped it up 2000 (laughs) in CFS because they blew out the river. Oh, I've been anchored in a hole and they did that. And that was pretty scary. It dragged dude, that's, that's, us that's, down. That's, dude, that's why you're crazy for doing that night fishing. I'd be so afraid while I was asleep that all of a sudden, I guess if you anchored, you know, like let out a crazy amount of rope before you, you know, actually held your anchor, I guess it would work, right? Because you just keep, you know, floating higher and higher and moving backwards, assuming that your anchor held. I found that too. My anchor was having trouble holding. I got that star anchor, not the pyramid. I think I got a lot more rope out before I bust that bad boy out. But I think I'll probably get a uh, a fifty pounder or a forty. I mean, a forty pounder for the uh, like chain anchor for the Yakima when it's big flows and stuff because that thing was having issues holding. But it was a killer trip for me, at least. Um, interesting to see the river at the, the, those flows when it's low like that it's just it, i think for anyone who does have a boat not if you have a hard boat but anyone who has a, a, a raft or something like that water master um and if you have a hard boat you should walk in whatever your favorite river is you should continually push to lower flows like keep float it when it's when the hose you know crazy low flows when the hose, you know, way, way down, if you can float it, float it, figure out what the lowest flow you can float that river at is. And the same is true the other way, figure out, push your limits in terms of what the maximum flow is. And then you have a really good idea of what flows you can float it. Like, Hey, I can float this thing all the way down to 
400 and I can fish it all the way up to 1500. That gives you a good idea. You know what I mean? Or like when the, when the hose at 800, try and float it, you know? Um, not if you have a hard boat again, don't float the hoe at 800. If you have, if you have a hard boat, but you've, if you figure out those lower flows, the amount of stuff that you see that you'd never see before. You know what I mean? Like you learn the river so much more at those lower flows than you do at high flows because you can see everything. You're like, oh, I didn't know that there's a boulder right there. I didn't know that there's, you know, this huge rock structure out in that deep hole that I can never see into because normally this is chocolate milk water moving through here, you mm -hmm. know? And so you, you learn about specific holes in particular especially on rivers that don't change that much like the kalawa or the nooch or something like that that's not moving large largely like the hoe is you know what i mean the hoe could be totally different year to year so that that's a tougher one but if you're floating the soul dock or whatever it's not going to change that much it might move a little bit but it's it's really not gonna you know what I mean? Like log jams might change or something, right. but it's not the river itself isn't moving. Whereas the hoe, you can be standing in a spot that is now dry land. That was the center stream last year. So, yeah. you know, but I think if you float at those low flows, you learn so much more about the water that you're going to fish that it is exponentially. I mean, the, your knowledge grows exponentially when you start doing stuff like that start mm -hmm. pushing the limits on both ends because you you just figure out so much about the water at higher flows you figure out where the, the main currents are and where the fish like to hold at those higher conditions um and vice versa at the low flows you figure out where the deep holding spots are and, and you learn a lot there too so i think it's it's worth it for people to go you know don't just go when the flows are perfect obviously go when the flows are perfect because you're probably going to catch the most fish but you know if the flows are low you should go and if the flows are low and they bump it all you should definitely go i mean that's prime time and if, if when flows are really low that means that fish are stacking up in holding spots right waiting to push forward and then when you get that bump they all push and so if you're there when it's low and then it bumps, you just caught that big push of fish up the, up the river. Cause they're all, you know, stacking up. And then as soon as the flows get high enough for them to push to the next section, they will, you know, if you get a, get a big push of rain or if it's a dam controlled river, they finally let the flows go. That's the time to be on the water. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think that that's worth it. Let's dig in a little bit now on some spay fishing stuff. Let's talk about our spay setups. So when I did my trip, I was using a, I think it's a f 11 foot six, I believe is what all those spay rods are from, uh, or switch rods are from Reddington. But it's a uh, five weight, 11 foot six, five weight switch rod from reddington which is a little bit on the lighter side than what i would recommend for most people um most people for summer on stuff i'd recommend a six weight or seven weight but i like that lighter rod i just happen to have it from pink fishing and so i was fishing that because we were floating a little bit tighter water especially at those low flows so i didn't need to huck it really far like i do with my 7130x um so i was fishing a SA spay light on that one and throwing a poly leader. I think it was a slow sink poly leader off the front. Um, and that's normally what I fish in the sound. That's really why I was fishing that. Ideally, I guess ideally at that flow, I'd probably have a Scandi on the end of that thing. Um, but I do like being able to get slightly down with that, you know, slow slink poly leader. Um, and for those who don't know, if you don't have a Scandi set up and you have like a floating compact Skagit of some kind, you can, you're not going to turn it into a Scandi, but you're going to create a lot more delicacy by using a poly reader on the end. Cause that it's a more aggressive jump between thickness to a, a taper than what a, a true Scandi would be. Like a true Scandi is like a giant 
tapered leader. It, it does a really good job of getting from a really fat section at the back to help you get that load all the way down to a really skinny section. And it's just kind of continues that. And then you normally throw like a nine foot or a six foot tapered leader at the end of that. And you're continuing that kind of taper all the way down. Um, so that's the idea of a Scandi. So you can kind of recreate that by using a poly leader on the end of your Skagit. It's not as good, right? Like you can, you can tow a boat, right? With your Honda SUV, but it's not as good as an F-150, you know? And the same is true with, with spay lines in general. I would, a Skagit line is a lot like a truck. It's meant for throwing junk, right? Like it's going to turn over huge flies, big, heavy sink tips. Like that's the whole point in a Skagit line. That said, super clunky, gets blown by the wind a lot, splashes down on the water. I mean, it, it lands heavy on the water. There are things that you can do to mitigate that, like casting slightly downstream. It doesn't land mm -hmm. as hard on the water, Throwing it in at kind of angles helps. It doesn't land as hard on the water. There's a bunch of things that you can do to, uh, you know, help it land on the water a little bit easier to get away with a schedule line like Mike does. Mike McGovney, who works at Puget Sound Fly Company, super badass with the spay. Yeah. Spay rod. Like, yeah, he's your guy. Ridiculously good with spay fishing. Does not fish a Scandi. So almost exclusively stays to compact Skagit lines, partly because he, he got, he was a part of the OPST, um, company. He was, he, uh, I think, I think he was their sales rep, technically speaking. I don't know what his actual title was there, but he went around and did a bunch of the promotion and he was one of the best casters there. He's really good buddies with Ed Ward and, uh, Jerry French, really, really good buddies with Jerry French. Um, and then he was the rep for, I think they call them Renegade Rods, right? The That's Jerry French's rod company. If I'm making a mistake there, I apologize, Jerry French. Um, Jerry French's rod series is who he was a rep for in Aquaflies for a long time. So, But he's extremely good at fishing summer rounds, especially he does uh, every year he does like a couple week long trip up to the BC. He's got a jet boat that he runs up there. And he crushes fish. I mean, crushes fish. That guy, oh, he's been in the industry a long, long time. Um, and he knows how to fish a spay rod for steelhead. That's for sure. And he fishes a Skagit when he goes up there, which is to be fishing the Skeena and the Bulkley and those rivers in the summertime with a Skagit. That's like, that's like saying curse words in church. That's like sacrilege to be up there for spay guys <laughs> in the summertime fishing this gadget. Like that's just something that you don't do. Um, cause, and everybody would tell you that's, that's a terrible idea. Like you should be fishing a Scandi, you know, like that's, that's the home of like, dude, you can skate them up and stuff. And Mike does skate them. He just always uses a Skagit. And then just changes out his sink tips and goes with really slow sinking sink tips. Mm -hmm. um, and he, I mean, he crushes fish when he goes up there in comparison to like what other people not from there do. I mean, he crushes fish. If he lived up there, you'd be like, that guy just crushed fish for that three weeks, let alone for a, a guy who's not from that area going up and, and swinging flies. Like that's impressive. Yeah. And, uh, He's fishing a Skagit the whole time, which for most people would be contrary to what they believe is, is effective. You know what I mean? Like people would tell you that on the Bulkley and on those rivers in the summertime, a Scandi is more effective because it's more delicate. You're not going to spook as many fish. Um, Mike would hard, very hard disagree with that. Mike's a pretty opinionated guy, so he lets you know what he thinks. Um, and he definitely believes in a Skagit system year-round. And he has a fair point, too. He says, basically, and Anil says the same thing. It's almost like Anil has this analogy where it's like if you drove a race car, like a Ferrari, right? And that's your Scandi line. You drove a Ferrari all the time. And then it came wintertime and you were going to switch over to a truck. 
you wouldn't be that great at driving a truck. You'd be like, you know, almost flipping it in turns and stuff. You'd be, you'd be terrible at it. And the same is true the other way. You, if you were driving the truck all year round, which is your Skagit line, right? And then you switch over for, you know, whatever it is in in Western Washington, the Scandi season is probably like at most a month where like Scandi fishing is, is legitimately effective. Yeah, I could agree with that. Yeah. And I never do it, but I could agree. Most with that. people don't. Most people don't get into it because it's not worth it. Honestly, if you're really into spay fishing, you probably own one because you're like everybody tells me that I need to own one. If you're on e- in Eastern Washington, you're in like the Grand Ron, or you're on the Snake or something for sure, or the Click and Tap for sure, get one. It works awesome there. Really, really good for those Columbia fish. Does not work that great on in Western Washington, like. If you're a shop, you're not going to carry that many Scandi lines. And if you are, you're kind of banking on guys going to the east side. But for western Washington, it's just not effective. There's a few times in the summer that you, yeah. know, you get reports. Usually it's the callets. Sure. And they're like, oh, you know, I skated this fly up. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You're like, oh, awesome. But, yeah. I mean, yeah. maybe six times you hear about it. You know, throughout the whole summer long. Oh, for sure. And that's a dude who is fishing the whole summer, every weekend, throwing his scandy, and he hooked one fish all summer on a on a I skater. Think he fishes scandies even in the winter. Yeah, I know a bunch of guys who do that, and I think you're crazy if you do that. I'm like, I'm hooking skadgets. <laughs> right. All day long. And you hear, like, all these old guys used to come in, and they'd be like, I read about in this book that this, you know, whoever – dude from the 80s who wrote this book is uh he'd fish a skater as a as a fish finder he'd float a skater through and and then a fish would come up and then he knew that there was a fish there and i always wanted to be like yeah go out to the bogus shield this winter and use your fish finder you tell me how many fish there are, bud. <laughs> you're gonna, yeah, oh, you're really going to see that one. <laughs> you're waiting for a, a fish to come up and swipe at your skater. And he's like, well, yeah, you know, like it doesn't. You're not planning to land the fish on that. You're just finding the fish. And then you skate a wet fly through, you know, like a normal classic pattern through and hook them. And I want to be like, you're insane, dude. Yeah, in the 80s when the bogus shield had a couple thousand fish in it at a time, sure, maybe even then I'm I'm like, I think you're full of BS, but maybe back then you could float a skater through and that was your fish finder and then you'd jump out and swing your your wet fly to catch them. Well, I've noticed that too when Uh it comes to Scandi, not a lot of younger generation of definitely not. people fishing fish scandy it's just not it's kind of funny though like a lot of younger guys seem to be super into spay fishing have you noticed that like yeah, it but seems they like a huck like huge dude, heads with giant. t14 t17 on there well it's like what we were talking about last time guys get so caught up in what a skagit can do that I think that they totally lose sight of what they probably should do. Well, he, my, like Mike, right? So yeah. he, he he was explaining a lot of like this gadget stuff, yeah. and he's like, you know, Which every, he's super good. At. I right. mean, he he helped with the OPST setup. Like he helped create what now is. I think almost all gadget systems are going to switch over to that compact short rod system. And the way he, he kind of explained that, too, was he he said, you need to fish 10 to 20 feet from you. Like, your first cast, you need to work that inside slot next to you, look at the water, read the, the water, amount of and people work your way out. that just skip over that and just start hucking mega. And oh, you're I can like, huck 100 feet. Look. Yeah. And it's like, you're that's like, pretty. You, well, it's like Sandstrom, Sandstrom was down on the Deschutes, I think he was saying. And he was like, just getting his head out, he was telling me. Like, just, you know, doing his roll cast to get his sink tip out of the guides. And he didn't even have his whole Skagit head out. And he, he's, you know, just letting it swing through because he's like, might as well. i got to get this whole thing out, you know. First cast. Yeah. Just dumps one out. Boom. Fish on. And we were talking about it. And he's like, most people 
would have spooked that fish because they would have started hucking uh-huh. to the other side of the river. Yep. Not hooked anything. Been swinging through and like, well, this run sucks. There's no fish in here. And really there was. You just skipped over that fish because mm-hmm. you don't know what you're doing. You know what I mean? Like you're just hucking to get out there and you're like, look at what I can do. Fish have to be on the other side of the river. And not necessarily, especially at higher flows, you should be swinging the inside seam very heavily. Yeah. Yep. Especially at higher flows because they tend to push to the inside, you know, when it's when it's big. And like you're saying, if you're not doing that, you're blowing a third, maybe even half if you're really throwing it far. You're probably blowing up half of the river. Yeah. You just eliminated your half of the river. You're banking on that you're going to hook a fish on the other side, which, by the way, extremely hard to get a very good swing when swinging the other half of the river because it's usually moving at a different current uh, than the yep. middle, and the middle's pulling your, you know, the tail end of your skagit head. And for you can't see if you're listening, but you get this kind of big reverse C, like the the, you know, curve of the C is facing downstream in your line and then it whips your fly through there and it's going by so fast that that's why you're that's why you upstream men people everybody i see (laughs) bait fishes so many people are guilty of it throw the cast in and as soon as it hits the water they mend they throw like this huge upstream mend and I'm like, do you even know why you're doing that? Like, are you just doing it because you think that that's spay fishing? You're it's like, yep. YouTube, man. It is. Guys just don't know what they're doing when they're mending. And they huck it out there. And then as soon as it hits the water, they throw this giant upstream mend. And you're like, why are you doing that? Are you trying to, to dredge the bottom? Like, what what's your goal? Like, I don't think that people put together, you don't have to mend. Like, if I want a shallow, like, summertime... I don't mend if I'm fishing a little No, you're going to get hung up pretty quick. Yeah, you cast it out there at like a 45 downstream and just as soon as it hits, it's swinging and just let it swing through. You don't have to throw mend. If I want to dredge like a deep hole, sure, I might cast even a little bit upstream of me Mm -hmm. and then throw a big mend so that way it sinks for a while and then it goes into its swing. I might throw a downstream end because I might hang up, right? So I want to swing it through faster so that way I don't hang up. There's all sorts of things. But you have to understand that your mend is you manipulating where in the water column the fly is and the direction with which you're swinging, the direction that your line is, which then either is going to move your fly faster or slower through, through that swing. Mm-hmm. So you have to figure out how to manipulate that fly. And I think people because they watched Skagit Masters or whatever on, on YouTube. They saw this guy, or the Todd Bowen video, and they saw this guy throw this huge mend as soon as it hits the water, and they're like, that's that's what I have to do. I have to cast out there, and then I have to throw this big mend in, and then it starts swinging it. And you're like, that's not the way to do it. you got to figure out per run, what do what does this run require of my fly? Does it require me to get way down? And if it does, then maybe that is the best choice is to as soon as it hits right. the water they don't know why they're throw doing a giant yeah they're, they're just doing, doing it. it yeah because they're like this is what i'm supposed to do mm-hmm. you know you have to learn how each thing affects your setup and like me and mike talked about it mike only fishes t11 now that's kind of his thing in the winter time and i switched over to only fish in t11 too and that's when i swung up that fish with you and, and jason gordon um and y- you can People switch sink tips, I find. People who do switch sink tips all the time don't know how to manipulate their casting and their manipulation of the rod through mending. They don't know how to do that very well. And so they're hoping that the sink tip is going to create that difference for them. Mm -hmm. Switching from T8, which is 8 to 9 inches per second sink, to T14, that's a pretty drastic jump. Right, Mm -hmm. in terms of how hard it is to cast those two. T8, 8 to 9, T11, 9 to 10, 10 to 12, or 10 to 11, sorry. So you just went from 8 to 9 to 10 to 11. You got an extra inch. Maybe if one was at the slowest side and one was at the fastest side, you got an extra two inches of depth per second. Mm -hmm. But now you're in fast current. 
So really, you probably actually got like maybe three inches further down, maybe six inches. If we want to be crazy and you switch to T17, right, from T8, which would be like the most insane jump ever. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Um, one of those two setups is not the right setup for you. Like, either that was the hardest thing to turn over ever or vice versa. You cast T8 and it's basically like, like you, you had something that was unweighted on the end of your fly. Um, so, you know, let's pretend that you switch, You had T8 with an unweighted fly versus T17 with a heavy fly. You And you cast the exact same cast in the exact same hole. You might notice a difference of a foot in terms of depth. You might get a foot lower. And so you're like, that's clearly not the way to do this. Like, that's just not how you're going to get more depth or less depth. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to manipulate your setup to create whatever depth or whatever effect on the fly that you want, you know, and following it with your rod tip is going to slow it down. Like you're going to have more time in the, the strike zone by doing that. Or you can keep your rod tip dead straight out in front of you and it'll create kind of a hinge and it'll swing the fly through further, you know, faster. So you just have to play with it and figure out these different ways that you can manipulate your fly to create these different effects. So that way you can more effectively fish a run because you know what your fly is doing based off of what you're doing with your rod, you know? And, and I think that that's so important that people learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think not, that's not stressed enough. Like people think, oh, I just need this wonder system. Oh, I need a, like the fist, right? Mm -hmm. That was such a big line, the airflow fist. Cause it's a, which for those who don't know, fist is an acronym. It stands for floating intermediate sink tip, right? And that's the way that the line is. The back of the line floats, middle is intermediate, and then it goes down to a sink three. And that's for the winter time. The idea is that it is extending kind of your skagit line and you're creating this smooth line that goes down to your, to your sink tip. And so you're able to get more depth because you're fishing, you know, half of your skagit head is getting down in the water on top of your sink tip. If people just figure out, and they're all tools, don't get me wrong. I use a fist sometimes if I really need to get down. But that said it's a tool in your arsenal. Like you, one doesn't preclude the other. You still need to be able to control your fly with what you're doing to make that fist work. Cause there's lots of scenarios where you, you wouldn't be able to fish a fist in winter time because it's too shallow of a run or whatever it is. If you don't know if, if your only tactic is to cast straight out in front of you, you know, and then throw a giant mend, you're going to hang up a lot with a fist you're going to hang up a lot with a fist. Whereas if you know what you're doing and now that it's shallower, you're casting it, you know, you know, at a 45 downstream. And as soon as it hits you, you're swinging it. You're probably not going to have an issue. You'll be able to fish skinny stuff. Mm -hmm. And then when you hit that deeper run, you cast out at a 90 degree angle, you cast out straight in front of you and you throw this giant mend, and then you swing through. That's the traditional swing, right? Boom. You will catch fish that way. Cause you're, you're, actively making a decision on how you're going to fish that section in order to manipulate your fly to get the right depth that you want. And I think too many people dredge the bottom. Yes. Too many people get caught up in like, yeah, I got to feel it. tick, 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 tick on the bottom, you know, like bouncing off the rocks. Mm -hmm. If you've ever seen a steelhead in the water, they're not, you know, just nudging their nose in the ground, waiting for something to come by. They're looking up. You know, they're probably six inches or so off the bottom and they're looking up and they're probably willing to come a foot, two foot off the bottom to come eat your stuff. So really you shouldn't feel the bottom very much. Maybe once in the in the skinny stuff you should feel it. But if you're fishing a deeper slot, you know, like a four foot deep hole, you really shouldn't feel the bottom. You should be swinging through that middle current. That's your ideal place because if a fish is riding higher, it's going to see it. If it's riding lower, it's going to see it. Because they're looking for the food, right? The food's coming through in the middle current where it's quick because they're little bait fish or they're a little, you know, scud or whatever it is. And they're looking in that middle current because that's where weak fish get pulled into is where the current's fastest. So you just got to know how to manipulate whatever your setup is to perform the way that you want it to perform. You can get away with fishing a Scandi or a Skagit 
in sections where you might, might not normally fish it, you know, it's probably not the ideal setup in that scenario by manipulating your stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and then you can get different performance attributes out of that setup. But that said, you don't use Scandi, right? No. Yeah. Ever. I'm just not personally me and my casting style. Scandi's yeah, not Yeah, you do me. have a very like uh I push. Yeah, you got an aggressive casting yeah. stroke where you like very uh like powerful and then you like stop for a second and then you like power it again. It's not like a slow fluid thing, which you definitely need to be like kind of slow and fluid with mm -hmm. this candy for the most part to, mm -hmm. to make it work. It's it's Scandi is definitely a lot harder to cast than a Skagit setup, in my opinion. Touch and go casts are just they're they're hard to do to get good at. Like to be able right. to do a snake roll and be able to do a, a single spay and stuff and not thwap yourself in the back of the head when you do that single spay because you didn't get the fly far enough upstream. Like to be able to do that is hard. And so for most people it's just not a uh, it's not a reasonable way for them to fish. If you're having no. issues with your Skagit line, do not switch to a no, Scandi. No, that's like not going to make be, life easier. Yeah, you need to be good with the Skagit line. And with the invent of, like, the Rage Compact system and, like, the spay, uh, more compact Scandies, it's gotten a little bit easier. Like, you can get away with doing touch and, or uh, sustained anchor casts, I mean. With those systems, you can do a snap T or Perry Poke or whatever with a with a Rage Head and still huck it out there decently. So that definitely helps people kind of get get into that system, and mm -hmm. you can still throw very light poly leaders on a on a Rage system very well. So you know it, it extends your ability there, and a Rage system is great. But I think more people would be better; they would get more benefit if they learn how to control their fly through manipulation of the rod than just hoping that the line in the sink tip is going to do the, the solving mm -hmm. for them. Yep. You know, like th they need to figure out how to, how to create that manipulation first with themselves. And then you can switch to all these different lines because then you really get the benefit of the lines. You know what I mean? Like there is a place in your arsenal for, every type of line that's made really yeah scenarios yeah there's just there's to. conditions where throwing a sinking scandy is really cool right or throwing a a sinking skagit line or a floating skagit line or a floating scandy like there's scenarios where all these things are the best option and they are a good tool to implement the majority of time in western washington fishing for an adramus fish your floating Skagit. I would say 80% mm -hmm. of the time your floating Skagit is the go-to. And I would say 95% of the time you can get away with the floating Skagit. It might not be ideal for that 15% of the time, but you can get away with it just fine. Well, I would say that there's... That's where those tips come into play. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, being able to manipulate your yep. stuff and, yep. and changing out tips to very slow sinking tips, poly leaders even, stuff like that. That's where that comes into play. Yeah, you don't have to throw 10 foot of T material on the end of your Skagit line. You can throw a, a salmon steelhead poly leader. You can throw a Mo tip that's mostly floating two and a half sink or whatever, or even a full floating Mo tip. Mm -hmm. You can do all sorts of stuff in order to manipulate that setup to perform the way that you want it to perform. Yep. And yep. that's something that you go into your shop and you talk to those people about hey, I'm fishing super low water but I still want to use my Skagit. How can I do it? And they'll help you. They'll help you figure out whatever system it is to kind of extend the life of your Skagit. Mm -hmm. That said, for the most part, what are you using? Um, what's your What's your go-to space setup right now? You're 8120, right? It's your 8120, X? Sage yeah. X. And yeah. then, uh, yeah, man, I, uh, let's see, I stick between like 575 and 600 usually. For my Skagit. Yeah, yeah, on that six weight. Yeah. What are you throwing on there? Skagit Max? Uh, or is it the short? No. Well, yeah, it's a Skagit short now. So Skagit I started with the Skagit long. 
Definitely not the way to go on that 8120. I don't. I mean, some no. guys like longer skagits. I don't think so. I just kind of worked my way down to what I what I needed. You know yeah. what I mean? What I thought and, was best. And for those who don't know, just a brief history of Skagit Line. Skagit Line starts up on the Skagit River here in Washington by a group of guys, basically. Um, at that time, like early 90s, a 9140, meaning a 14 foot nine weight, is probably the most popular rod being sold and like a 50 foot head a real wind cutter is probably the most popular but that head in particular is about 50 feet and they sold tips that went on it like a tip system does not turn over those tips very well if you've ever cast a real wind cutter on a 9140 which i have extremely difficult to cast very very hard to cast it just was not user friendly you get very tired throwing a 9140 all day it's just it, it's a rod that makes you work hard to get it to, to perform and so with that then edward and those dudes start cutting down these big, giant like 12 weight lines basically in double tapers and stuff to create the first gadget heads the idea is that they can get shorter lines get the same amount of power but now turn over bigger sink tips and bigger flies and that's the whole point in this gadget head this gadget head is a short compact line that's designed to turn over sink tips and large flies and basically what we've seen especially with the advent of opst lines and stuff we've seen rods get shorter which is easier on you the caster you won't get as much distance but much much easier for you so we've seen rods get shorter, more guys getting into switches, more guys getting into basically 12 foot, I would say, has started to become the most popular Skagit length for a rod. So most guys are getting into Skagit rods now, you know, like the IMX Pro Short Space or the 12 foot Sage X's or even switch rods are very popular too and compact spay lines. So sub 12, 20 foot basically is what I would call a compact spay line. A traditional spay line would be between 20 and 30 foot. A traditional Scandi line is between 30 and 40 foot for the most part. So Rio has three Skagit Max series. They have a Skagit Max short, which is 20 foot. Skagit Max, which is around 24, 25 foot, depending on. And that depends on the grain weight. Usually the higher in grain weight you go, the longer the line is in that system. And then they have a Skagit Max long, which is like 27 or 28, I think. Um, for the most part. So that gives you a good idea of kind of where that sits. And OPST lines, for those who don't know, kind of 18 foot and under, depending on the grain weight, they continuously get shorter. Um, and then they're, I think, the, I think they might actually top out at 16 foot now. I don't remember. But, uh, and then Airflow and, and SA all make their own, you know, kind of that 18, 16 foot range of, uh, of lines too, all the way up to 20 foot. So that's kind of the compact series of stuff. And so Matt is talking about he's using the Skagit Max Short, which is a 20-foot Skagit. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of on that borderline where it's almost a compact Skagit, but it's still kind of traditional. And then he's throwing that on a 12-foot 8-weight Sage Axe, which I think is a good pairing. I mean, it, those, well, it feels great. I mean, dude, those Sage, surprise. Those Sage Axe Bay Rods, hawk. They do. They load really yeah. well. Yeah, <laughs> really well. Yeah. No, Geo convinced me on the on getting that seventy one thirty, and I cast it against the Asquith too. And the Asquith is amazing, super super lightweight. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Asquith is slightly more powerful, but I like the feel a lot more on the Sage X personally. Like I just like how that rod feels for me, um, and I don't throw like I throw a little bit better with the Sage X too. So for me, I'm really into the, the Sage X space, but yeah, so I fished that 7130 heavily, like really heavily. I'm super into that rod. You are super into your 8120. Um, yep. I'm, so you're throwing that. What's your running line? Um, right now, I just have Veravoss. Um, yep. For those who don't know, Veravoss is a monofilament running line company. It's actually a hollowed out uh running line so that way it floats like it it's hollow on the inside so it floats on top of the water that's why guys like it because you don't have to carry as many loops for guys who aren't super into spay fishing or don't cast really far as you get to cast further and further you then 
carry more and more monofilament hanging off the bottom. And if your monofilament is normal monofilament, meaning that it sinks, or even if it floats, it gets dragged way downstream at you because you're in current. And then your line is losing energy by pulling that monofilament back up and then through the guides. So what you do is you carry loops in your bottom hand. Generally, some guys do it in the top top hand just depends one of your two hands on the rod you're holding your actual monofilament that leads right to your skagit head and then you've got a couple loops of slack line that you then drop as soon as you cast so what we're talking about here is bat likes a floating monofilament line so that way when he does drop it it doesn't sink and get pulled downstream it kind of stays on top you get a little bit more distance out of that setup there are pros and cons to that. I think that that I'm not a fan of that line as much. I fished it for a while because it, it tends to coil on me really bad. Like I get bad tangles and everybody agrees it does coil mm -hmm. badly. It does get bad tangles. It is a huge pain in the ass to stretch that line. Especially when it's cold. When it's really cold in the wintertime, it's brutal. Summer run fishing, I love it. It's awesome. But wintertime stuff, it's brutal to fish. It's just so coily. And you know, I haven't found anything that's not like that in the winter. There's some that are a little bit better than yeah. others. Yeah. But, I mean. The stuff that we have at the shop, the anil stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which isn't even anil stuff. I found that stuff. But I let him take credit for it, you know? That's the problem. He's just he's just such a uh, big public figure. I had to throw a big name behind it, you know? Mm -hmm. That's exactly yeah, it. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yep. Um, but that stuff is awesome. That stuff is so limp, even in the even in the cold, it's still limp. N I mean, it's not crazy, but in the summertime, it's crazy limp. But in the wintertime, it, even that 40, I think it's 40 pound, is still pretty darn limp. Like it's it's very manageable. It's definitely not as slick as Veravas is. Like it's right. which some people like. Some people don't like how slick Veravas is. It's hard to hang on to in the wintertime. Um which I got a pro tip one time from Charles St. Pierre, who taught me how to spay cast, is to hold it, pinch it in your front finger, but then take it and go over the reel and then pinch it with your bottom hand too. And that allows you to have two pinch points and really a third with that because you're kind of, you know, causing it to go around the mm -hmm. reel and pinch on that reel too. Um, and I don't have issues anymore with losing the spay line like ever. Uh, you know, like the monofilament sliding through your fingers, which a lot of people have issues with monofilament sliding through their fingers. I usually towards the end of the day. Yeah. If it's cold out, it's hard to hang on to for sure. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, that's a killer setup for sure. And we, what do you throw them for a sink tip most of the time? Like T14? Honestly, T11. I range from like <laughs> about T8, T11. I stay with the three. Yeah. T8, T11, T14. Yeah. Mainly I have T11 to T14 on usually because yeah. I just yeah. like how that feels. Yep. Um, yep. But if it's lower water, clear water, I'm throwing the T8 usually. Yeah. Um, but... It just it just depends, but usually I stay with those three. That's like my bread and butter. No, I'm with you. I agree. Um, for me, I'm throwing that seventy one thirty. I think I've got a. I think I've got a Rio Skagit Max. I kind of switch between that. I've got a fist line that I throw on it sometimes. I've also got a old uh, Scientific Anglers. Uh, Skagit line too that I like to throw on there that's just a full float and classic but for the most part it's that Skagit Max um, I kind of switch between 540 575 um, well actually it's 550 in the Skagit Max not 540 because they do 25 versus 30 grain increments but uh, so I throw that a bunch that's kind of my go to and then usually T11 that just allows me to manipulate it the best, I think, with a float, a full floating Skagit line and then a sink tip allows me to get kind of mend a little bit easier than a fist. Because once you got to kind of like with the fist, you got to kind of like cast out and immediately set your line. You know, like if you're going to mend, you got to do it immediately because otherwise the, the head is sinking. So you got to set your line quickly and then you roll with whatever swing it gives you whereas a, a floating skagit line you can kind of manipulate mid swing you can do all sorts of other stuff to it so 
most of the time I'm running that floating Skagit head and that, that just tends to work for me the best. So I do that for the most part, I'm running that Anil's, uh, running line that's at the shop. You can mm-hmm. pick that up at PJ sound fly company. Um, yeah, for the most part, I'm using that stuff. That's it's killer stuff. I don't mind a little bit less distance out of it. I do use Veravos when it's summertime or like fall because I get a little bit more distance and I don't notice the coil issue as much. Um, but sometimes I switch over to Rio's Connect Core too. And I go to the smallest size, which is the 026, which is like a 20 pound core. But most of the time I'm running like 17 pound uh, fluorocarbon leader anyways. So I'm not worried about it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um but I do like the connect core stuff, the actual like fly line style running line, because it's really thin, that 026. Um, I think it's meant for Trout's Bay stuff, but I use it anyways. I usually flip it too, so run it reverse, so that way the really thin section is at the front. Because mm-hmm. right, they normally do like a bumped up section on those lines, so that way like you have like a handling section, they call it. I don't like that, so I flip it around the other way. Um but I like how much I feel with connect core. Cause if you're, you're using monofilament, the average monofilament has about a 60% stretch, 50 to 60% stretch to it. Meaning if you had 10 feet of monofilament and you stretched it, it would stretch to 15 to 16 feet before it broke. Mm-hmm. Right. For me, Jim Kerr is the one who pointed this out to me. For me, that means when your fish bites, it has to move a ways with, you know, if you're watching your Skagit head, which I usually am, that's usually what I see first is the Skagit head move or just stop moving basically. Mm-hmm. And that's when I know that I have a fish, but I don't feel anything. Like there's no feel going on. Like you're not feeling a little tug. You're not feeling anything really with it for the most part with a a monofilament Mm -hmm. line and i didn't know that i wasn't feeling anything until i switched to the fly line style based off of his recommendation so i switch over start using the, the fly line style and it's crazy how much more you feel like if you are dredging bottom or something because you're fishing for chinook or something like that like you feel tick 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 and you know that you're like hey i'm too low let me switch sink tips or whatever. Let me get up a little bit. And then you're swinging and you're like, dude, I feel everything. Mm-hmm. Like if there, if there is a tick, I feel it. Cause there's in the connect core, there's literally zero stretch. It's made with a, a braided core. So you feel like if, if the fly moves at all, you feel it. Mm-hmm. Cause you've got, minimal stretch at best in your skagit head because your skagit head's not connect core it's it's the normal stuff same with your sink tip it's the normal stuff so like you might have 10 percent stretch across that so for me dude it's crazy how much more i feel with the connect core stuff and i'm not worried about distance i can throw pretty far so for me i'm like i'm willing to sacrifice for me personally it's usually like 10 feet is about what i lose between veravos versus connect core going with the smallest size connect core um so i'm like dude that i'll take that 10 foot loss i don't need to cast that far you know i can still get out an 80 foot cast with my connect core stuff and a 540 head no problem so that's usually what I'm running in, in, in the dead of winter because it's super low memory. You almost never have knots with fly line style stuff, and it, it hucks. The only problem is, is when, when you do get the twists from you know doing snap tees and stuff, um, it can be a little bit brutal there like because your fly line just twists up into knots. But, and it, it's not like monofilament where it's easy to get out. The important thing with the connect core stuff, though, is... And same is true with monofilament. People don't do this enough. You wear very heavily on the first 10 feet or so of your monofilament or of your connect core, whatever your running line is, you wear very heavily on it because you're doing all these spinning casts, you know, like snap tees and stuff. Mm -hmm. You're just rubbing on that first eyelet like a big, you know, like it's just wearing down. And so every... You know, I'd say for the average guy, every fourth trip or whatever, you should cut back four or five feet of your monofilament. And if it's connect core, which I get it, it's more expensive and monofilament's expensive too. 
but your Skagit head's more expensive. You don't want to lose your Skagit head. Cut back every five feet. And if it's connect core or something, cut back every six months. Cut back five feet and then redo a knot in your running line. You know, whether that's heating it and, and remelting it together, or you can even take um, thread, tying thread, and create a loop. That's usually what I do. Mm-hmm. It's really strong that way, it bites in. Um, you should constantly be redoing your loops like that, like it, it, for sure. Gary Sandstrom actually just does a clinch knot to the uh, to his Skagit head, like it's almost mm-hmm. like the eye of a hook. I like that too. I do that frequently rather than doing a giant loop. It move if you leave a long tag in, like a three inch tag in, it slides through the guides like it's nothing. Like I, I just don't trim the knot because I don't care if it's a four inch tag end or five inch tag end. Who cares? It's thirty feet away from my fly, you know. More actually, because you got a twenty foot, twenty five foot head, ten feet. There you go. You got thirty five feet, and then I got like a six foot sink tip, so I'm almost forty something feet away from my my fly with that tag end. So I don't really care if my tag end is super long. So. That's my setup most of the time, um, but I do really like switch rods. Like for summer run fishing, especially when it's when I'm fishing a little bit closer stuff, I like switch rods a lot. The thirteen footer I got because I for like this yeah um, yeah the Skagit River and the Lower Bogey, the Ho Cowlitz, I use it on that. Um, but a switch rod is more than enough for all those rivers too so switch rods are, are cool i'm really into them especially 12 foot rods 12 mm-hmm. foot rods i think are probably my favorite length of rod like i think that's kind of strikes the happy medium between easy to cast but also very user friendly mm-hmm. you know and still hucks Definitely. for distance yeah that's probably my go-to what do you think the next rod you're gonna get is dude i'm not sure Cause it's kind of never ending right no, like you're always not. buying always you're always buying something especially when you work at the shop you're always buying something i'm looking at the sage mavericks the new ones that they had that they came out that replaced the motives and all that you yeah know? what do you it's their new saltwater series yeah yeah same. yeah um six weight though i think sexy dude. yeah they do have a cool six weight and you don't have a very cool six weight right now so, no i don't yeah. actually i think i have an echo base as my six weight because i barely fish six weights. yeah yeah no, I meant though in the uh, spay rod. What are you looking at? Oh, spay rod wise. Yeah, what's your next spay rod, dude? I I don't know. I'm I might try one of those new OPST rods out. They're pretty cool. They're light, like they super you lightweight, know, and it's I don't know it's how that compact setup. Pretty yeah, much, you can get the for whole sure OPST like yeah pack system. Kit, yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I think I might dabble on that because I've only fished OPST a little bit enough sure. to. Yeah. Once you switch to it, 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 you'll get real into it for like probably a year and then you'll probably go back to your 8120. Yeah. Because you get really caught up in like, you're like, oh my God. At least for me, like I tend to get caught up in whatever attribute that rod has. And so for me, like I'm like, oh, this is so easy. Like you're just getting fat. Like I got so into that IMX Pro Shorts Bay when mm-hmm. I had that thing for like a, a whole season where I was just like, it's so easy to cast. And I was throwing the old Skagit switch on it. And, oh, dude, it's just like you you can hawk far, reasonably far with those short systems. But you can turn over such big flies with those OPST mm-hmm. heads that you're like, oh, this is just, it's crazy how easy it is to cast. It's just, it's it's effortless. You know what I mean? And, uh, but eventually you're like, oh, I kind of want to cast out a little bit further and then that's when you're like right. your 8120 crawls back in and it's calling from the back saying what about me matt what about me well and then they're say, i'll bring both usually yeah exactly happens. no that's the way to do it and then you just crowd the front of my boat and take up all the space yeah nobody packs more stuff than you you, dude, I got to have snacks, you, clothes. You, you are the, the packer extraordinaire, dude. When I pull up to Matt's house to pick him up and we're going camping or whatever and I got the boat in back, this guy will fill up half of my truck bed and fill up the, the whole back seat. Hey. <laughs> You'll come out with like eight bags. You're like, well, dude, I got to have – I got – Four bags for the boat. I got you. You always bring. You got three bags that you always bring in the boat. You got your giant boat bag, the biggest size boat bag. Yeah. And then you got your huge Patagonia roll top because yep. that's gonna hold all your clothes. 
and then you normally got like another bag or you're taking up half my cooler for your lunch yeah well snacks dude you gotta have yeah. snacks it's important i'll to give snacks. you that you always got snacks yeah yeah so, snacks yeah. and drinks you gotta have them both yeah dude if you're in a boat and you don't bring an insane amount of snacks like you have no excuse if you're in a boat to not bring enough snacks that, right exactly that's how i feel and plus if I, and especially in your raft like i yeah. got that front section you well, know and it looks raft, bare so my raft is pretty spacey but is. if you were floating in stews like his little pack 13 oh dude i had to bring my small boat bag dude, and there my is, small little roll top there's it was bad. no space in that boat when you're in the pack 13 dude it feels tiny you do, yeah you feel like you're in a canoe but you're yeah. sitting like way up <laughs> yeah, on right? top of yeah, the canoe exactly. you're like oh we're gonna tip yeah, yeah this is gonna happen it's so narrow in comparison to my boat yeah no i definitely get what you're saying there but I always have to bring, you know, spare clothes. A lot of people are like, ah, oh, whatever, Dude, spare no. clothes. But I that, know, one that one you time you don't bring that it. I, that I fell in, I didn't bring any spare clothes that day. And I did fall in. And then I was I was screwed. <laughs> you were screwed. Right? Yeah. Hey, you toughed it out. You finished the flow. I know, like, yeah, yeah. You I didn't, didn't have to. Yeah, no, we I all were like, hey, forward, let's bro. push and get you warm. No, and, dude, I wanted some fish. Yeah. And we ended up getting a couple. Yeah, we did. So yeah, we and did. Well, my wet body was very happy that we caught some fish. So it was worth it, in my opinion. Yes, I But agree. it was a brutal day. That made me laugh so hard when Ryan was like, wait, you fell in yesterday? He's like, ooh, I would not have wanted to fall in yesterday. And I was like, yeah, dude, you're telling me. <laughs> <laughs> we were down. We had to float to the mouth of the quill, you man, like where the wind is the worst. Yep. We were floating down to the, the shitty section, you know? Yeah. Uh, that was rough. I'm with you. I think I'm probably going to get like a seven weight Sajax switch or something. That's probably my next. Or maybe the NRX switch. I'm kind of up Ooh, in the air. But the NRXs are pretty awesome. They are. I like the feel of them. Um, but I'm leaning toward getting a switch rod set up again. I just like that shorter rod. I had a switch rod set up for the beach. That's what I used mine for. Well, yeah, you get your three weight, which is badass. I love that three weight. Yeah, it is that awesome. Little, the dually three weight is what Matt's got with an integrated spade light on the end of it, intermediate. And I have the same setup in a five weight because I wanted one for pinks. And, oh, such a good rod. For the money, you cannot beat a Reddington Dually, not even close. They're crazy good. Not a fan of the new cork, though, that they put on them in the big sizes because they put this really soft EVA foam, like, mixture um, that's supposed to look like composite on, on the fronts of them, and I really pull heavily with my bottom hand and, and kind of dig my thumb in on the top. And, dude, like, my thumb just, on, like, Bennett's seven weight, my thumb just presses clean to the blank every time. Like, I can feel the blank when I pop for it. So that's my only complaint with the rod. But otherwise, ooh, unreal. I mean, they're so lightweight. They're really durable. And they cast so nice. Like, yeah. when I'm fishing my five weight, I'm not like, man, this rod sucks. I'm so sad that I'm fishing a $279 rod. I'm like, this rod's awesome. This thing is crazy good, especially to get in trout spay per se. Like oh, with that, thing. yeah, exactly. Like I don't, I don't fish. If I, I would never buy a really expensive five weight switch rod because I use it a handful. The majority of the time, it just sits in my garage. Right. But a two hundred and seventy nine dollar one with I put a Lampson liquid on it, which is like a hundred and thirty dollar reel, dude. Cheap setup, fish is great and it's totally usable. And I fish that integrated scientific angler line on it, and it's badass. I'm a huge fan for sure. And it hooks, right? It throws Just for the beach, dude. Your three weight on the beach for for cutties, oh, dude, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. I wish they made it one size smaller. Well, I had the two weight Reddington um, hydrogen, and I really liked it, but sometimes it got a little too windy. But that dually three weight i think is kind of the happy medium because it throws i think you throw 250 on there yeah 250 yeah. 275 which is a six weight 275 is a seven weight um for the most part i mean it's kind of like six ish seven in that ballpark but so i mean that's how you gotta think of it like you're basically fishing a six weight in terms of what flies you can turn over and stuff like mm -hmm. that 
but it feels like a three weight when you're landing fish. Right. That, exactly. That's the cool part about trout spay is, is that you can turn over based off of the grain weight that you're throwing, but the number aligns with what you feel. Mm hmm. And I think that's a confusing thing to most people. They're like, I don't want to fish a three weight. I fish a six weight out in the sound. And you're like, dude, the six weights for like summer on steelhead because you're really fishing like an eight weight, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and especially your three weights kind of on the stiffer side. So it really is almost like a three bump. It really does kind of feel like a six weight. Whereas I would say most feel more like a five weight. Usually it's a two bump for a switch rod. Um, but that thing's bad ass. That yeah. thing is awesome. Yeah. No, I love that thing. We should take it to the uh, yak. I really want to go to the yak. Yeah. Do some, some swinging with that. Now, there you could do a scandy line and actually see yeah, what you I could, mean. You could skate the, some little soft hackles or something and do awesome. Yeah. Dude, even the. Or little um, uh, October Cata skaters. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah, for sure. No, I mean, that's a killer setup. Well, that about does it for today. Thanks so much, everyone, for listening. Check in next week.